Great harmonica. Huh. Wasn't that great? Oh, man. Wonderful. Beautiful. Let's pause for a moment of prayer. Let us pray. We give thanks, Lord, for the gift of life, the gift of your word, the gift of your son, the gift of your spirit. May we be open in these moments of reflection on the richness with which you want us to live our life. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I mentioned a couple weeks ago that I was at the Westmont Leadership Conference and David Brooks was one of the speakers, the columnist and um, a commentator. And uh, one of the stories he told really stuck with me, intrigued me. Um, he said that one night he was working at home. I think he lives in the suburbs of DC in Virginia perhaps, but he was at home working and his front door and he could see her come in the entryway. But in that moment, she didn't notice that he was there working, um, even though I guess the door was open to his study. And instead of doing the usual greeting, he just kind of watched her for a minute. And she came in and kind of got her bearings and then I think like her purse down or something and looked around a little bit and then walked off to the kitchen, I think, or something. But he said in that unexpected moment, he realized how much he loved her. And he said the word, the best word he could come up with for what that felt like was he was beholding her. Beholding her. Now he went on to talk about why this is important to think about in our time, because he says we live in an era in which we're busy and our minds are busy, and often when we encounter people that we don't know, we've already got a predetermined idea of what they're going to say or believe or think, and we're listening as much to our own ideas as whatever they might be saying. Even people that we know well and with them, sometimes they're, we're in a conversation and they've said something and we're just waiting for them to finish so we can say what we want, and then they're kind of doing the same. He, he says we, we, we live in a, an era of social blindness, that we don't really pay attention to each other like we might. And he talked about what a contrast that is when we behold someone or behold some experience. I got really interested in the word behold. And I thought, that's a great biblical word, I think. And uh, so I, I, I looked it up. <clears throat> In the King James translations of the Bible, the word behold occurs 1,298 times. And in a lot of modern translations, the New International Version, for example, it's one time. And a lot of other translations, maybe 10, 15, 20, 30. But behold is kind of lost. <laughs> and I got really intrigued about those passages where Centuries ago, the translators, that committee in England, came up with the word behold so often. And nowadays, maybe we don't use it as much, so translators use words that we're more familiar with. But I looked up uh, the root of the word, and um, in Old English, it originally was beholden, and it meant give regard to or hold in view. Give regard to or hold in view in view. So we're having some experience, we're encountering something or someone, and we're, we're taking a minute to really be with them. And then I started looking at some of these passages, and I'm going to read you some of these um, from different parts of the Bible that um, include this. Behold, in the good old King James, occurs first in the first book of the Bible, in Genesis. Towards the end, it occurs twice. Genesis 1.29, at the end of this beautiful poetic image of creation of all these layers of life and matter all uh, coming one after the other, all intertwined, interdependent. Uh, it comes where everything's created. And then Elohim, the Lord says, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree, in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed, and goes on to describe all the wonderful food and everything we need to, to have for life. And it began by saying, behold. It's like, now, pay attention. Maybe the first words we hear are, pay attention. You got what you need right here. You got to care for it. 
But then that chapter ends. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Six times in Genesis, the word is good, tov in Hebrew. Light and day, tov. Water and, and land, tov. All these different layers of creation. Every one of them's tov. And it reminds me of when we're working on a project. I used to do a lot of house painting, and maybe you come into a room and you're gonna paint it, and you, first you gotta see what the prep work is, you remove the plates, and then you maybe see if there's things that need to be filled, and then you just spackle some areas, maybe prime it, and then paint it, and maybe the trim, and, and all these times you're working, and you think, okay, that looks good, okay, that looks good, that looks good. And then, hopefully, when you get all done, sometimes you come in the next day and you're like, oh, it looks great. It's like you can behold all the work you've done. And I think in Genesis, <clears throat> this sense of God saying, okay, all these stages have been good, but when you take everything together, the way it's put together, behold, it's very good. Really pay attention to that, the fact that it's fundamentally really good. And in the Jewish tradition, there's no greater gift than the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is really meant to be a day where we stop working and being so busy with our busy mind and just appreciate and savor the life that we're living in in the moment. To really look around and do the things that we do, to be with people, to be with the ritual perhaps, to be in nature, to slow down, and just realize that we've got all kinds of things that, that occupy our mind all through the week, but just take a time to look at all that we live in, this amazing world, and say, Really, it's very good, beautiful. I want to behold it. Another incident of behold in the King James, uh, Psalm 27, four. One thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. This great yearning, I just want to be in a worship service. I just want to be in a temple. And I just want to behold the beauty of God's presence. Now, we know we can do that lots of places in nature, um, many places. It's not restricted to buildings. And I know I've been in different parts of the world and all kinds of different buildings. And you can go into many kinds of temples. And there's a, there's a beauty that often you can experience. And I gotta say, I love being in this temple, this Summerlin building. I mean, when I first walked in and these wood floors and the bell and the steeple, there's soul here. There's a respect for time. There's respect for good craftsmanship. There's a sense that people have been here worshiping and, and being together for a long time. And last week, I know when I was listening to the music, there were a couple times when the harmonies just I was, lifted me up. I was beholding the beauty of that music. And today with you all, and you were singing, and that harmonica came out, I was beholding not just the music right here, but thinking of the roots where it came from, the faith behind that song where it came from, maybe the hills of Appalachia or something, you know? But that, that American tradition of people just wanting to praise the beauty of God and the promises and the assurances. Something we can aspire to is those moments we can just behold the beauty of the Lord often in sanctuaries. Another interesting example to me, Mark 10. It's a famous story. Jesus is um, moving along through his day, and uh, a rich young ruler comes up and says, good, uh, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. But then he answers the, the, the fellow and says, basically lists some commandments that he could follow and do that and you shall live. But then the young man says, all these I've done since my youth. And it's as if there's something more. Here's what it says. Then Jesus beholding him, loved him. If that first part of the conversation, imagine as Jesus is traveling, people are asking him questions all the time. Sometimes, of course, they're trying to ensnare him in debates or other things. And maybe much of the time he was just giving responses that, that were ordinary responses that made sense for whatever somebody was asking. But something in this conversation with this young man, maybe the tone, maybe the look in his eye, it's like Jesus beheld him and loved him. 
And then it was like, oh, I know what you need to do. You need to sell all you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. And we know that the young man went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. But the point what I'm looking at today isn't so much the consequence of that conversation, but the moment in which it occurred. Jesus beheld this person and loved this person and then gave them the message that they needed to hear. I think back in times, perhaps all of us, crossroads in our life where we were seeking guidance and the guidance came. A couple weeks ago, I shared 30 years ago uh, when I was invited to come to Goleta and a, I had a lot of resistance, but I felt a clear leading. I saw the fountain uh, to come, to come. And I trusted that. I wasn't quite sure, but I looked back after a few months and I realized God knew a lot better than me. And it's as if in those moments when we're seeking guidance, we can be assured that as if Jesus looking down and beholding us and loving us and then telling us what we need to do to take the next step to perhaps come out of the darkness into light or to make a change in our life or to keep something that, 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 that we've got already. I believe God is always beholding us all the time. So one thinks about the practice of beholding uh, that we can encounter at lots of places. Last year, we rented a condo up in Mammoth, like a lot of folks do. We'd never done that, and we had our family come up and our grandkids and things. And we did different things, different days. And one day, several of us went fishing over by June Lake, over by Rush Creek. Maybe some of you know that creek. <clears throat> and we were kind of split up, and we were fishing different parts of the stream. And frankly, I didn't think many fish were going to be coming that day, so I wasn't fishing too much in earnest. But <clears throat> I was just by myself, by this little creek running. And it wasn't a spectacular waterfall. There was no soundtrack, angelic chorus or something, or some travel thing. It was just a simple little creek flowing along under the shade of these trees. And I started to feel, I started to behold it. Where instead of thinking about all the things we're always thinking about, I was just like there with that creek. And I was like, it's beautiful, this quiet little creek. It's not going to be on a travel poster. It's an ordinary creek but it's an extraordinary event that I get to be here with a gift of life, looking at this flowing water in this mountain stream. It's wonderful when we can take a chance to behold something in nature, feel that gift that beholding can give us. I think at times in my professional life when I've um, had experiences of beholding, um, I was uh, executive director at Hospice of Santa Barbara for five and a half years, and when I came into that position, it wasn't because I was a clergy person. Uh, I, most of my work was administrative and community events and fundraising and things. But occasionally, some of our folks would call me in if they needed a religious guy, you know, a guy with credentials. <laughs> and in one particular situation, one of our wonderful social workers was working with a family. Uh, there was the mom who was dying at home and, and the two daughters and adult daughters, and the daughters haven't really been getting along all that well in, in the recent years, and so our social worker was just very skillful, and she'd been working with them, the, hoping that to be caring for mom and to be there when she passes, that that could be a strengthening thing for their relationship. And so one day she came to me and said, I'm gonna do a ritual for this family, they've agreed to it, and you have to be there and, and help me. And, I trusted this person implicitly, and I said, whatever you want to do, I'll, I'll be glad to do it. So I met her at the house, <clears throat> and she explained what was going to happen, that mom was in a hospital bed there in the, in the living room, and she told the daughters that day to really fix mom up, uh, do her hair, do a manicure, pedicure, just you know, dress her up really well. Mom wasn't very conscious. She was still there, but not very conscious. But the, the point was to, to, to do that, to, to create that respect for mom. And then my friend, the social worker, she was going to be at, behind the head of the mother and kind of begin things. And then each daughter was at one hand, and they were supposed to lift up the mother's hand and say anything that came to them about appreciation or love for their mom. And then I was going to do the feet. And I remember thinking, they didn't teach me in seminary how to bless feet. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> but 
it began with, with, uh, with, with my, my colleagues, starting with a blessing of, of the woman. Um, and then the first daughter went, and then the second daughter. And then it came to me, and I picked up her feet in her 80s, and she had her pedicure, I think her red, still see the red uh, polish. And I just said, Lord, thank you for these feet. For these feet, with these feet, she just took her first steps as a little child and ran down the hallway to see her parents. With these feet, she would have walked her first day to school. She would have maybe danced her first dance at school and maybe walked down the aisle when she was married. With his feet, he bore each of these daughters and carried them at night, followed them to school. All these years, these feet have been faithful servants, and they're a gift from you. And went on a little bit. It was all true. And how appropriate it was that we took a moment to behold this person's physical, the gift of life that God had given her, and including these feet, just to behold what all they'd done, all the love they communicated. So we have opportunities on different times in life to behold. And I want to close with this memory of having little kids, you know, little ones, little toddlers and things. And boy, they, they get up in the morning and you're chasing them and trying to get them dressed, get them to breakfast, get them to school or preschool or whatever. And you go to work and you're busy with everything and come and pick them up and maybe they play for a while and then you got to fix some dinner and then they eat quickly and they're off running and you got to clean it up. And you go through the thing, maybe take a bath, maybe read a story, reading a story, reading it, going slower and slower with each page, hoping that'll take effect. Or, you know, walking them or rocking them, depending on what age. And then you finally get them to bed, and it's like, ah, I just hope they'll stay asleep. And you sneak out of the room, and you're exhausted from the day. And all the things you've been responsible for. And then maybe 10 minutes later, you think, maybe I should go check on them. And you go down the hallway, and you open the door, and you look at them. You know what people often say? When they're asleep, they look like angels. And you look at them without all the duties on your mind, all the jobs you've got, which are important for raising a child. You just see them for the miracle they are. In that moment, you're beholding that child. And I believe, as we see demonstrated in the love of Jesus, we're being held in that love all the time. God is beholding us all the time. 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called children of God. And we are. Last week on Father's Day, we talked about that love that Jesus experienced at the baptism, he invited us all to share in that love that he had with his Father. 1 John, behold what manner of love that we get to share in. And don't just think about it. Behold it. Hold it with reverence and think about what a gift it is. In all those moments of beholding, love is speaking. Sometimes through words, sometimes just through our own inner thoughts. Love is being spoken, and when love is spoken, it's something to behold. Let us pray. Oh Lord, for the many miracles of life that surround us, some of which we notice and so many we take for granted, for all of those we give you thanks. For the gift of life, we give you thanks. For the gift of Jesus and all he does for us. For the way with him and in your spirit you're with us, beholding us, loving us, day after day, month after month, year after year. For all this we give you great and endless thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's go forth looking for opportunities in this day and this week to behold moments in nature, moments with people we know, perhaps people we don't even know that well. To behold is to take in reverence, give attention, full attention to. Give thanks to God for the opportunity that we have to do that. And the more we're beholding the glory of God, the more we're drawn into the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the limitless love of God and the infinite presence of the Holy Spirit. And all the people say, Amen. Amen. You prepare. 
prepare a table in the presence of my foes. You anoint my head and my cup overflows and surely I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and surely In the house of the Lord forever. In the house of the Lord.